I am delighted to welcome you to this special community gathering to celebrate our Presidential and Regents Award winners. Please join me uh, in standing for the National Anthem, which will be sung by our UMBC Camarada, directed by David Smith. Following the anthem, the Camarada will sing our university alma mater and one other selection, and you will find the words to the alma mater, which we're all memorizing these days, right? Uh, on the inside of the program. Oh, very good. That's your retouch from mechanical engineer. Just like those mechanical engineers will be ahead of everybody else. This is good. seated as they sing one more selection.
Before you leave, let, let me just say, we are so proud of our group of the Camarada. They performed, they participated in the Christmas in Washington, attended by the president and other national figures, and the, the participation and performance was broadcast on TNT television. And this past April, they performed at Carnegie Hall with John Rutta, an internationally renowned composer and choral director. Give a wonderful David Smith and our special students to come right another day. Very nice. We're very proud of you. And David, I will tell you that Professor Tableski has a great voice, so you may want to get him to be a, a guest appearance from time to time. It'd be nice to have a mechanical engineering in there. Your Charles would appreciate that. But thank you all very much. All right. <laughs> we get some of the faculty performing with you. Thank you all very much for today. We are here to recognize our colleagues for their impressive contributions to the university, their special areas of research, and in the community. But before we move any further, I want to take a moment and, and ask all the family members of the research awardees to stand. Any family member or special friends who are here, thank frankly. Would you give them a hand, please? Please give them a hand. We all know nobody does anything alone as a rule and, and really succeeds. It takes people giving you support, and I know they would want me to say thank you to all of them. Also, <coughs> we have some of the former and current presidential teaching and, and research professors and previous distinguished staff awardees, uh, award winners. Would any of those people please stand so we can applaud you? Please give them a hand. Yes. I'll come back and talk a moment in just a, a moment about a number of things, um, but at this point I want to turn the program over to our great provost. This is his last time doing this. I know he's very sad about that, but give him a big hand. All right, Johnson, would you? Thank you. With each one of these events, it's the last time I'll be doing this, so I guess I'll, I'll be hearing that for a while. It gives me great pleasure to honor the Presidential Faculty and Staff Award winners. The 2007-2010 Presidential Teaching Professor, Dr. L. D. Timmy Topoleski, has made remarkable contributions to the education of UMBC undergraduate and graduate students during his 18-year teaching career at UMBC. Dr. Topoleski serves as Graduate Program Director of Mechanical Engineering, and under his direction, the program has seen a dramatic transformation both in size and quality. He helped the department receive two prestigious graduate assistants in areas of national need awards from the U.S. Department of Education. Teaching undergraduates has always been one of Dr. Topoleski's first priorities. He has taught 11 different undergraduate courses, three of which he created and developed. In addition, he reorganized and restructured two courses in order to introduce case-based learning modules and other elements. One of the courses he developed, Introduction to Design, has become a cornerstone course for the design element of mechanical engineering's undergraduate curriculum. When Dr. Topoleski realized that the writing and oral communication skills of students needed to be improved, he rewrote part of the course to help students strengthen their skills. He subsequently created and taught an honor section for his strength of materials class to continue to give students an intensive writing and communications experience. Dr. Topoleski also is active in working with and advising students outside of the classroom. He is a mentor to several Meyerhoff students in the department, mentoring as many as 11 in recent years. He has been a regular lecturer for the Honors Forum, and he co-developed and taught a Humanity Scholars Seminar with Dr. Jay Fryman in Ancient Studies. Last year, Dr. Topoleski received the Faculty of the Year Award from the Honors College for his teaching. And he also has received Humanities Teaching Fellow and Orientation Teaching Fellow Awards. Dr. Topoleski earned a BS in the Interdisciplinary College Scholars Program and a, mechanical, a, a uh, Master's in Engineering and MS in Mechanical Engineering from Cornell University. He went on to receive his PhD degree in Bioengineering from the University of Pennsylvania. Please join me in congratulating the 2010 2007-2010 Presidential Teaching Professor, Dr. Timmy Topolesky.
Thank you. Thank you so much. I knew somebody would put that there. I, th this is remarkable. It's been a remarkable week for me, and I have four minutes to tell you about playing in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, take you back to Yosemite National Park, talk about the Meyerhoff Scholars, and then bring it all together. I played in Beethoven's Ninth Symphony this past weekend, and I play violin with the Columbia Orchestra. And the main thing you want to do when you play the first violin is that nobody knows you're playing. You don't want to mess up, because that's the only way they should know you're playing. You're one of 250 people making this incredible music. And it, it is an incredible experience to be part of something that's, that's bigger than you are. And when I started thinking about things that are much bigger than I, I remembered years ago when my wife and I went to Yosemite, and she can tell you how long ago that was. And I decided to climb up this remarkable place called Half Dome. And Marcy was not going to go up with me, but I ended up going up with a, a bunch of college students. And I said, I'm not going to let those guys beat me up this mountain. It was a 17, 18 mile trek, about 10 hours worth. I don't remember what we talked about going up. But when we got to the top, one of the students turned to me and said, this is the biggest thing I have ever done. This is the biggest thing I have ever done. And I looked at him thinking, you just wait. You just wait. But what was remarkable was when I was coming down Half Dome, I decided to walk with people more my age. And I hooked up with a husband and wife. And we got to talking, and, and I said, I'm a college professor. And they said, we're high school guidance counselors from Los Angeles. I said, oh, I work at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. You may not. Oh. We know about UMBC. We know about the Meyerhoff program. All the way, and that was a long time ago, yeah. not just now. And to be part of the Meyerhoff's 20th anniversary celebration this weekend was an event I will never forget. And I look at what Freeman has done, and what Art has done, and what we all have done for the Meyerhoff students, and remembering that when we have conviction, we can really make a difference. It is just incredible. And then to bring this all together, to, f to finish up, a few years ago, my wife gave me a remarkable opportunity for my birthday, and it was the chance to sit with the Bal uh, Baltimore Symphony Orchestra during rehearsal next to the concertmaster, arguably one of the best violinists in the world. And there was a soloist there, Vadim Repin, arguably even better. And we were looking at the music, and he turned to me, Jonathan Carney, the concertmaster, turned to me and said, see, they're, they're trying to play this perfectly. And this hard part is not meant to be played perfectly. It's meant to give a feel. The, the composer wants a feel. And I said, you guys do that? You guys fake it? He said, he said yeah, all the time. And, and I, I said, you know, if the best musicians in the world can't get it perfect every time, who am I to try to do this? And I recognize we're still learning and we're still trying to put things together. And to give the students a feel for what we do and to give the students the opportunity to learn with me when I make mistakes is one of the greatest pleasures I have here at UMBC. So Dr. Hrabowski, Dr. Johnson, all my friends from mechanical engineering across the university, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Congratulations, sir. The recipient of the 2007-2010 Presidential Research Professor Award, Dr. Thomas Matthew, is a professor in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics and is internationally recognized as an authority on multivariate statistical analysis, bioequivalence testing, and statistical tolerance intervals. As an elected fellow of both the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, Dr. Matthew is a member of one of the most select group of statistical scientists in the field. He is known for his foundational statistical contributions to the field of interlaboratory testing. His work was recognized with the Yudin Award for interlaboratory testing from the American Statistical Association. Dr. Matthew is the author of one of the leading books in the field, Statistical Tests, for mixed linear models, and is currently working on a highly anticipated book on statistical tolerance regions, representing a current area of research. He has been a co-editor or associate editor of four prestigious international statistics journals, and he has produced 85 original research articles, many of them in leading statistics journals. Exceptional, exceptionally prolific in obtaining independent funding for his research, 
Matthew has received grants from the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, and the Army Research Office. Since coming to UMBC in 1985, Dr. Matthew has provided a high level of service to UMBC and the Department of Mathematics and Statistics. He was instrumental in the creation of the BS program in statistics, including writing the program proposal and helping to create new undergraduate and graduate courses. After graduation, his students often received prominent positions at universities and in industry. His versatility as a researcher is evident in the doctoral dissertations he has supervised on a wide variety of topics. Dr. Matthew earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a master's degree in statistics from the University of Kerala, India. He received his PhD in statistics from the Indian, Indian Statistical Institute. Please join me in honoring Dr. Thomas Matthew as the 2007-2010 Presidential Research Professor. Yes, I, I was sitting there, um, I was wondering if I would feel a little nervous standing here and speaking. So I programmed myself to think of you, my STAT 121 audience. So everything is fine. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, receiving any type of recognition for your achievements is obviously a great honor. But uh, what makes this award particularly gratifying for me is the fact that uh, I have been associated with the STAT program since its inception and I could contribute to our research productivity, which eventually resulted in our being rated among the to top 25 programs worldwide. Uh, in fact, we are rated 22nd in the world in terms of research productivity. <laughs> and obviously the STAT program has received great support at the departmental level and at the university level. Uh, in fact, I am the second statistician to receive this award. My senior colleague, Dr. Sinha, received this award a few years back. And one of my math colleagues, Dr. Gowda, received the teaching award a few years back. So it is really gratifying to know that we are recognized both within the university and outside. So I want to thank the university administration and the department for their support and for providing us with whatever we needed to excel. Now, for me personally, UMBC has been a place of great significance in my career. So I came to UMBC in 85, immediately after getting my PhD from the Indian Statistical Institute. And UMBC is the place where all great things happen to me. Research accomplishments, uh, external funding, <laughs> teaching, supervision of doctoral students, etc., etc. In short, UMBC has made me what I am today. Uh, and I want to thank the uh, Math and Stud Department, in particular my colleagues uh, Nagaraj Nirchal and Bimal Sinha for taking the initiative to nominate me. And I certainly want to express my deep appreciation for the many graduate students, doctoral students, with whom I had the great privilege of interacting and with whom I continue to interact. I have pushed them to work hard and do their best and they have pushed me to do the same. Finally, to my parents and to my family, I don't have adequate words to express my appreciation for whatever they have done for me. So President Habowski, Provost Johnson, and all of you, thank you. Miss. Danita Eichenlaub, Associate Director of the Goddard Earth Sciences and Technology Center, or GESS, and the Joint Center for Earth Systems Technology, or JSET, is the recipient of the 2007 Presidential Distinguished Staff Award for Professional Staff. In addition to her outstanding management skills, Ms. Eichenlaub has demonstrated leadership in the development of financial systems and controls, which are now being modeled across the campus. Ms. Eichenlaub supervises all aspects of the administrative and financial management for two centers, GUEST and JSET. She has merged the two administrative staffs from GUEST and JSET into one team and monitors annual sponsored research funding 
of 20 to 25 million dollars. As one of the original PeopleSoft peer mentors, Ms. Eichenlaub is frequently consulted for her expertise in business processes and the management of a large administrative unit. She serves on the HR Finance Advisory Board and the HR Upgrade Committee. Ms. Eichenlaub takes time to train business staff across the campus in business specialist skills, helping them to be more efficient in their jobs. She is acknowledged as a mentor by the center's nearly 200 research faculty. Her diligence, perseverance, knowledge, and ownership of the centers make an important difference to both her colleagues and to UMBC. Despite her large workload, she brings a teaching attitude and patience to every situation. Ms. Eichenlaub received her bachelor's degree in physics and her MAS in administrative science from Johns Hopkins University. Please join me in congratulating the recipient of the 2007 Presidential Distinguished Staff Award for Professional Staff, Ms. Danita Eichenlaub. selected to receive this award. And as was mentioned in the opening remarks, it's certainly true that such recognition is not a solitary achievement. And I'd like to just quickly acknowledge a few people who have been so instrumental in my success. I'm most fortunate today that both of my parents are here to share this day with me. And they're right up here at the front table. As a child and a teenager, it was not unusual for us to end up with a dictionary, an atlas, or a volume of the World Book Encyclopedia on the dinner table to settle a point of discussion. My parents encouraged my interest, celebrated my success, and provided me with the loving and stable environment that gave me the confidence that I needed to be open to new ideas and experiences. My husband's also here today once again demonstrating his love and support as he constantly has over the last 34 years. <laughs> Dennis has been my sympathetic ear and my shoulder to cry on, but even more important, he's been my personal cheerleader. For it's certainly without his understanding and help, I would not be here today. Some of you may know that for more than 20 years I worked as an engineer for a private defense contractor. When I took a position at UMBC, I started an entirely second career. The list of people who have helped me make the adjustment from private industry to the academic environment is so long that if I started to list everybody, you'd think we were at the Oscars rather than here at UMBC. But I have to give a special big thank you to the faculty and staff at the Guest and Jesuit Centers. The staff make working here at UMBC a daily pleasure, and the faculty make it a rewarding and interesting experience. But the most special thank you has to go to Dr. Raymond Hoff, the director of the Guest and Jesuit Centers. It's been a privilege not only to work for him, but with him since I came to UMBC. His openness, his willingness to listen, his support, and his confidence in me have been invaluable. I never heard a child respond to the question, what do you want to be when you grow up with? I want to be a research administrator. <laughs> it's not a career I intentionally chose when I graduated from college, but I'm absolutely delighted to have ended up there. It's been much more rewarding than I could have ever experienced, anticipated. My experiences at Guest and JSAT have changed the fundamental way that I view research. It is so exciting to see the results of research started many years ago actually having an application to a very real and immediate issue. I now see that not only does our research extend the frontiers of our knowledge, but we are sowing seeds for the future. Some of these seeds may never take root, some will establish a foundation for future discoveries, and some will impact us now. To me, research has become a statement of faith, faith in possibilities, and faith in the future. And I'd just like to thank all of you for the vote of confidence and the well wishes that I've received. 
Thank you. I want to be a research administrator. <laughs> the recipient of the 2007 Presidential Distinguished Staff Award for Non-Exempt Staff, Ms. Ethel Willie Haskins Cotton, is the Insurance Program Specialist for University Health Services. Her dedication and initiative have greatly enhanced the services UHS provides to the campus community. She patiently spends time helping international students, graduate students, and other students, many of whom are managing their health care for the very first time, understand the complexities of medical insurance. Ms. Haskins Cotton established a third-party billing program enabling major insurance companies to reimburse many of the medical services UHS provides. Because of her hard work, UHF, UHS has been able to expand its range of services at a time when many college health centers have had to decrease services due to funding shortages. Ms. Haskins Cotton's responsibilities include negotiating with major insurance companies, providing information to patients, overseeing medical coding, and managing the billing office. She is the key point person for members of the UMBC community who have insurance and billing questions. She manages the UMBC student insurance enrollment process for graduate assistants and international students and acts as an ombudsperson for all students enrolled in UMBC's student health plan. Because of her outstanding foresight, Ms. Hastings Cotton has been the catalyst for ideas that improve efficiency at UHS, including the creation of a separate checkout area for patients that greatly reduces the number of calls and questions about student bills. An outstanding team member and supervisor, Ms. Haskins Cotton, Haskins Cotton, goes beyond her responsibilities to assist UHS staff. For example, she volunteered to become the office point person for technical issues, teaching herself many of the complexities involved in using the software and then training her coworkers. Please join me in congratulating the 2007 Presidential Distinguished Staff Award for non-exempt staff, Ms. Ethel Willie Haskins Cotton. For a few minutes, I wondered what I was doing up here, because it sure sounded like we're the, there were some wonderful folks here. And uh, then I realized that you always have to have worker bees. And the worker bees are necessary to help the other folks do what they need to do. Uh, my 59th birthday is tomorrow. And <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and I can't think of a better present from UNBC. When I interviewed for my job at University Health Services five years ago, I immediately knew that that was where I wanted to be. I've never changed my mind about that. Even on the bad days, I love my job. Our staff has become a second family to me, encouraging and supporting me. Our director, Jen Lepus, has become my mentor, helping me to hone my skills. I tell everybody who will listen to me that I'm going to retire from that job. <laughs> At least I hope I will. <laughs> I didn't think anything could make this any sweeter until today. Thank you, UNBC, Dr. Hrabowski, Selection Committee, Jen Lepus, and all of my colleagues across the campus for supporting me and recognizing me. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The only reason she told us she was going to be 59 is because she knows she looks good, right? So she, she wants you to say, oh, you don't look that old. <laughs> Please join me in congratulating the Presidential Faculty and Staff Award winners once again. Now it is my pleasure to introduce Bria McElroy, Assistant Director of International Relations for the Center for Women and in Information Technology and co-chair of the President's Commission for Women. She will present the President's Commission for Women Achievement Award. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I have the honor today of, of introducing Claudia Morrell. She is the winner of our 2008 Achievement Award for the President's Commission for Women. And I'd also like to invite our other co-chair, Lorraine Charity, up with me as well. 
Um, it's really an honor to be able to give this award uh, to Claudia. She's also my boss. Um, <laughs> Claudia has worked in service of the university and wider community on the issues of gender and technology for seven years here at UMBC. As director of the Center for Women in IT, she has developed the Sewitt Scholars Program, which provides scholarships and programmatic support to young women and men pursuing their undergraduate degrees in IT and engineering. The Sewitt Scholars Program currently retains 94% of its students which is a retention rate that far exceeds the normal rate of retention for students in these majors. Claudia has also grown our center from just two employees under the direction of Dr. Joan Kornman, our, our founder, uh, to 41 staff, students, teachers, and faculty who work to support girls and women's participation and advancement in STEM fields. Under her leadership, the center has developed successful initiatives at every level um, of the pipeline from K-12 education through college and the workforce and technology entrepreneurship, including its annual event at UMBC Computer Mania Day in its sixth year this year, uh, an after-school technology program and summer camp, um, an Activate program, which I know Lorraine wants to say a special word about, and also was instrumental in drafting legislation that created the first statewide, statewide Governor's Task Force on the Status of Women in IT. Furthermore, Claudia speaks, as you may know, at the state, national, and international uh, level on issues of gender and technology, including recent presentations at the United Nations and at the World Bank. She developed the first international symposium on women and ICTs that took place in Baltimore in 2005, and also has helped to establish the International Task Force on Women and ICTs. Uh, Claudia is regarded as one of the foremost experts on gender issues in technology in the world, and it's hard to measure the degree to which she has helped to advance the status of women in technology and engineering, both here at UMBC and across the globe. So it is my honor to stand here with Lorraine and, <laughs> and award her today. Um, she has been personally a, a tremendous role model and mentor to me for five years. So I, I'll let Lorraine say a couple of words. Thank you. Hi, again, I'm Lorraine Charity, co-chair of the President's Commission for Women. And Claudia Morrell has, plays a major role in the success of the Activate program. For those of you who may not know, the Activate program teaches women how to start technology corporations. As a graduate of the Activate program of 2007, I have firsthand knowledge of the benefits provided by Claudia's efforts. So Claudia Morrell, the President's Commission for Women thanks you and honors you for all the outstanding work you've done to highlight the success of women here at UMBC. Thank you so much. She's also a parent, a daughter's graduating. She give him a big hand for that, for being a parent of a UMBC student. Yeah, really like her. my heart. So let's see if I can reduce my remarks to a minute or two, um, when I have so much, so much to be thankful for. I, I wanted to first send, since I do work internationally, send greetings from Vivian Redding, who is a commissioner for the European Commission. And um, she's been finalizing some research in Europe that she wanted me to share with my American colleagues, uh, particularly around women in technology. And she wants you to know that in Europe they have found that there is, in fact, no glass ceiling just a really thick layer of men. <laughs> so we're, we're going to be looking into that. You know, this award is very bittersweet for me. I came here uh, and, under Dr. John, Joan Kornman and promised I would work here for five years. It's now been almost seven. And so realizing that growth only happens in change, uh, I've actually been working to think about my next steps and my next strategy, and so have decided to leave the university at the end of June of this year. And it is with some great sadness, because this has been a terrific journey and a wonderful, wonderful learning experience. I have been deeply honored to be here at UMBC, 
and I take with me so much knowledge and learning, it, it's going to be an, a, a continuing great adventure. But I also say this, that this is a critical time for me now to, to talk about behind every great woman is more great women. Um, and the strength of the program for CWIT, I'm confident, will remain. I think what concerned me yesterday in a conversation was that somehow in the course of these seven years, I have not adequately conveyed the contributions of the many, many people that have really helped to form CWIT. So that while I am simply one face in this whole project, there are so many others who have quietly sat back and not been honored. And so I see this award as an opportunity to salute the women, the many wonderful women at UMBC. And there are terrific men as well. But since this is an award from the President's Commission for Women, I, I will note a few of them, but uh, I, let me just take a moment to honor them. One in particular stands out as a woman who was on my hiring and selection committee and has really been a huge supporter of mine, and that's Pat McDermott. And Pat McDermott was not only a, a person who gave me an opportunity to work here, but was also the visionary behind the idea of the CWIT scholars. So while I get a lot of, you know, a lot of pats on the back for that, it was really her vision. And all I needed to do was implement it. And I did that with the help of a lot of additional people as well. Um, another person that really helped me kick things off that is often hidden behind the scenes but really deserves all the recognition for her hard work and determination for really revising the engineering education program here is Dr. Tarn Bales, who's sitting right over there very quietly. We wrote three grants together when we first got on campus, and I think it surprised quite a few people. But what has ended up happening is that she has gone on to write her own grants, build her own programs, and really get both national and uh, regional recognition uh, for her work. And her dedication to her students inspires me every day. She's also helped me to build, this, or she built the CSIMS program and is now helping me to provide a site scholar program that inspires students across the campus in science, technology, engineering, and math fields. For the advanced program, Lynn Zimmerman and, and uh, Phyllis Robinson, as well as Taryn and uh, many others, uh, were, were visionaries together. And I enjoyed that experience so much. And it's so wonderful to see that whole project unfold. Anita Kamladi has been a tremendous inspiration to me in the information systems department and has worked with me both on supporting girls in, in middle school programs all the way through to using her expertise to build an international web portal that will support women around the world. Michelle Wolf is really a quiet visionary behind the Shriver Center. What a terrific leader. She does, the, she does projects and leads people around this campus, supporting our students and programs, connecting us together, and bringing us to the highest levels of, of thought leadership around social justice and social issues and support for Baltimore City and so many other areas that she touches. All my students and their internships, they have so much to be thankful for, and I appreciate it so much, Michelle. And, but that hasn't just been the women here at UMBC. Diane Lee, who's always got an open door, and um, Julie Lenzer Kirk, who runs our Activate program, and so many others I could name. But it's also so many women outside of the university who aren't here today, but have always been there for me when I need them. People like Shirley Collier, Sheila Hines, Beth Perlman, who helped to pass the task force, who showed up in Annapolis when I really needed her to do that. People like Carol Siemens, who helps with our Bits and Bytes program, who spends time with high school kids to try and get them on the campus. Again, I could go on and on. But I suppose the greatest honor really goes to the people who work with me on a day-to-day -day basis. Kelly, Summy, Amira Bilal, Michelle Miller, and Bria McElroy. And I would be remiss if I didn't really talk about the wind beneath my wings, and that would be my family. My three daughters, and the one man who's going to get a note today, my husband, Dr. Christopher Morrell. Thank you very, very much. Each year, the University System of Maryland Board of Regents honors a select group of faculty and staff for their outstanding achievements. I am pleased to announce that this year, the Board of Regents has recognized a UMBC faculty member for his distinguished performance. Mr. Christopher Corbett, Professor of the Practice English and award-winning journalist, 
is the recipient of the 2007-2008 University System of Maryland Board of Regents Faculty Award for Mentoring. While teaching nearly all the journalism courses offered by the Department of English since 1990, Mr. Corbett has served as the faculty advisor to the Retriever Weekly. He led its student editors and writers to three Reese Claghorn Fellowships in recent years and has helped hundreds of undergraduates hone their critical thinking, writing, and editing skills. He accomplished this through weekly meetings with the newspaper staff and providing sage advice and unflagging support at all hours of the day and night. Among Mr. Corbett's greatest contributions at UMBC is identifying internships and jobs in journalism for undergraduates. He has supervised dozens of students and placements with news organizations in the Baltimore, Washington area, and graduates have gone on to full-time jobs at many of these organizations. Recent graduates are currently working for National Public Radio, the Baltimore Sun, the Annapolis Capitol, the Maryland Gazette, the Eastern Star Democrat, and the Chesapeake Business Ledger, as well as for newspapers across the United States. Several of Corbett's mentees have won major professional awards. Mr. Corbett's former students attest to the extraordinary quality of his mentoring and seek his counsel on important career decisions long after they have graduated from UMBC. Mr. Corbett has worked for the Associated Press, first as a staff writer and legislative reporter, then as news editor for the Middle Atlantic States. He was a nationally syndicated travel writer for the Universal Press Syndicate, publishing in the country's most prominent newspapers. He is a regular columnist for Baltimore Style Magazine and is working on his third book. He recently received the Excellence in Journalism Award for editorial writing from the Society of Professional Journalism. Mr. Corbett received his bachelor's degree in speech from Northwestern University. Please join me in recognizing Mr. Christopher Corbett, the 2007-2008 University System Board of Regents Faculty Award recipient for mentoring. There's no question that there's a direct connection between internships and gainful employment. And as the father of a college student who will be looking for gainful employment very soon, I want you to know that I think very highly of gainful employment. Uh, last December, two UMBC graduates, Jenny Choi and Brad Schlesher, went to work for the Baltimore Sun straight out of UMBC, and they did this at a time where it's difficult to get a job in the newspaper business. They were both interns at the Baltimore Sun, so one thing led to another. The editor of the Retriever Weekly next year, Alex Piles, will just won the Maryland-Delaware DC Press Association's Reese Claghorn Fellowship. That's the third one we've won in recent years. And we are in direct competition with College Park. And I cannot tell you how much I like to tell you that. <laughs> Reese Cleghorn was a bureau chief in Atlanta when I ran the office in Baltimore. So uh, I, uh, I like to remind you of that. I don't see him very often, but uh, it's a nice thing to be able to mention. Uh, Alex is going to be working for the Wilmington News Journal this summer. He also just won the NCAA Sports Fellowship. And these are highly competitive internships and fellowships where you're competing against big J schools around the country. And our students are able to compete with the best of them. Uh, it's a pleasure to work with these kids. I enjoy it immensely. This has been a very amusing and uh, occasionally alarming second career. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I thank uh, my colleagues in the English department, Robert DeLuti in psychology, uh, and uh, Dr. Hrabrowski and Dr. Johnson for their support and uh, this opportunity and for their considerable patience. Thank you. Before I introduce the University System Maryland Board of Regents staff winner, I want to recognize the UMBC staff members whose extraordinary work has been honored with a nomination by the campus for the USM Board of Regents Staff Award for 
2008. The Board of Regents will conduct the selection process for these awards later this year. Please stand as I call your name. The Outstanding Service to Students nominee is Catherine Belosky. Kathy here? <laughs> Stay standing, Kathy. Director of Undergraduate Student Services in the College of Engineering and Information Technology, representing exempt staff. The nominees for exceptional contribution to the mission of the university are Patricia Martin, Program Management Specialist in Student Support Services, representing non-exempt staff, and Dennis Cuddy, Manager of Administration and Facilities in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry, representing extent, exempt staff. Are Patty and Dennis in the room? And finally, for extraordinary public service to UMBC or the greater community, the nominees are Karen Sweeney Jett, Executive Administrative Assistant in the Office of Institutional Advancement, representing non-exempt staff, and Ernestine Baker, Executive Director of the Meyerhoff Scholarship Program, representing exempt staff. Now I'm pleased to introduce the 2006-2007 USM Board of Regents Award recipient for Outstanding Service to Students, Ms. Cindy Kubiak. <laughs> Ms. Kubiak is Director of Sports Medicine for the Athletics Department. For 29 years, she has provided exceptional sports medicine service to student athletes participating in intercollegiate athletics, athletics at UMBC. In addition to her responsibilities involving student athletes, gen, uh, student athletes general health care, Ms. Kubiak focuses on program and policy development, budget management, recruitment, and training. She supervises and trains a staff that has grown to include four assistant trainers and 10 to 15 student trainers. And she coordinates the activities of two team physicians and other healthcare professionals who treat student athletes. Ms. Kubia established a training program that includes recruitment, educational forums, clinical experiences, and a career development and mentor program. Throughout her service to UMBC, many of her student trainers have entered healthcare professions. Her holistic approach toward working with student athletes led to the creation of the Life Skills Program in 1986. This three credit course, Introduction to Health Behaviors, is required for all UMBC student athletes and covers such topics as study skills, coping strategies, eating disorders, dating violence, decision making, alcohol education, and stress management. In addition, Ms. Kubiak has coordinated sports medicine efforts for such events as the Maryland State Games, the first and second rounds of the NCAA Men's Basketball Championships, the NCAA Women's Lacrosse Championships, and numerous NCAA youth education through sports clinics and conference championships. She also helped plan the creation of the athletic training rooms at UMBC Stadium and Retrievers Activity Center. Ms. Kubiak received her bachelor's degree in health, physical education, and recreation from the University of Pittsburgh, and her master's degree in education from the University of Virginia. Please join me in congratulating Ms. Cindy Kubiak, the 2006-2007 USM Board of Regents Award recipient for outstanding service to students. I'd like to thank Dr. Brown for nominating me and the Staff Awards Committee for their time in preparing the documents uh, for the Board of Regents Review. I'm going to start off by saying I'm not good at public speaking. Um, I'm pretty much a behind the scenes person. My work with our student athletes and students in general uh, is really much more a one on one. Whether that's working with an injured or a sick student athlete or teaching our student staff or even my professional staff about patient care. Our work in athletics is really quite different than a lot of departments on campus. We interact with our students on almost a 24-7 basis. Um, sometimes on some road trips, we might be together for 15 hours a day. The teams we work with really become our second families. This year, that meant for me that I started off the year by consoling our volleyball players when one of their teammates was tragically killed in an automobile accident. 
On the other end of the spectrum, I get to celebrate with the success of our men's basketball program and going on to the NCAAs for the first time in the season. Without a doubt, I couldn't do this job without the support of my husband, Lewis. He tolerates my crazy hours, which seem to get worse with each passing year, because he knows that I really love working with our students, with our team physicians, and with all of my staff over the years. That's really been what it's about. I'm one of the lucky people. I figured out in really eighth grade what I wanted to do for a career. I used to watch football games with my dad and say, that little guy that runs out in the field to take care of the injured people, that, that's what I want to do. So, I mean, the bottom line was it took sports, which I loved, and science, which I loved, and medicine, which I loved, and it put it all together in one profession. But there was only one problem. It was a little guy that ran out there to do that. There really wasn't any women in the field. When I got to Pitt, they started an athletic training curriculum. I was one of two female students. Uh, pretty much, I had to fight continually in order to gain access to educational opportunities. When the football coach, at that point in time, we were heading off to the national championship pit, um, said that he wasn't going to allow women to work with the football team. I pretty much didn't resign myself to the fact that that was going to be the case. And as I fought, I found myself a mentor, and that was our head trainer. He picked up a phone, called one of the other institutions, Carnegie Mellon, and said, you want to take this young lady on and work with your football program over there? It, it was just that one little thing that he did that opened a door for me. And from there, I ended up at UVA. They put me at an all-male institute at Washington Lee for my graduate assistantship. Today, almost half of, of the people entering the field of athletic training are women. Um, and it was just little things that, uh, that, that my mentor did for me that helped me open those doors. So, okay. Like I said, I'm a bad public speaker here. <laughs> Let me get back to how I got here, why I told you that story. I think my experience is trying to break in, break down barriers, become a woman in a man's profession, really influenced me as to how I see my job with our students. The grand portion of my day may be spent with patient evaluations, treatment, rehab, but I'm always looking for that opportunity to open a door for a student. I consider myself fortunate to work in a job where I get to work with young, smart adults, and they're just starting to figure out their career path in life. Mentoring is the fun part of most of our jobs here on the university campus. When I was asked to forward copies of thank you letters and notes for the committee to review, it was the first time I looked at some of those letters and notes from parents and students from 10, 15, 20 years ago. And it made me really realize how much impact we have in the lives of our students. Everyone here working with students, we all have an opportunity to positively impact our student, our coworkers' life, to help them become successful. And it's often the little things we do in our jobs that make the most difference. And sometimes it's even work that's not even our job. Uh, just recognizing that something needs to be done. So let me say, to finish up here, it's an honor to receive this award, to be recognized for my service, but my real reward is, is every day. Every day seeing people go from injured and not being able to participate to back onto our fields, from walk-on status on our teams, to being in the starting lineup, from scholarship athletes expected to do well and then actually doing well in national and international competition. It's a real privilege to work here at UBC with such wonderful people and I really have to thank my husband for supporting me in my effort to make every day a better day for our students. Thank you. It's inspiring to hear the different stories and to hear somebody saying, I want to be that person going out on the field, or I, I want to be that research administrator, even if she didn't know it at that time. <laughs> I suspect that Claudia didn't think when she was growing up necessarily, I'd be this champion of women in technology, but or that, that Willie could have said something about being an insurance, some person in insurance. It's interesting. What comes through, though, is that we do have people who are breaking down barriers, 
and changing attitudes of people and taking great pride in the work, the pride in, and, and having confidence in the work they're doing to make a difference in the lives of people. You know, Timmy was telling me a story, Professor Topoleski, about he and his wife were down in Florida and, and on vacation uh, recently, and they just happened to realize that the National Black Student Engineering Group was there, and one of his students, Brandon Johnson, Dr. Johnson's son, was part of that group. So they, they take time out of their vacation to go and take the kids to dinner. You know, just, just in the midst of vacationing, it's all connected, the student life and working with other people. And then when I think about Tom Matthew and one of the things that he said to me about the research, and you think about it, 22, number 22 in the, in the world in statistics. We have to find ways of, of telling that story about the quality of the research we have in different areas. It is a very impressive story. And I have to tell you that, that um, Chris Corbett does a remarkable job in educating and supporting our students in so many ways. Uh, with the retriever, because keep in mind, he can't tell people what to do at the retriever. Just as I can't tell any of you what to do in any of your jobs, sorry. I do know that, I really do, all right? But you work to persuade, right? And to build consensus and shared governance, and he does a superb job in that. And Cindy, when I saw you with those basketball players, and everybody went to come and just hugged you, and then it was just, you know, it was like a big sister or mama, and it was just so incredible. So I want us to all stand up and give the entire group a big round of applause. Would you do that? <laughs> I'm going to give you just some quick updates for the next under 10 minutes, very quickly. Uh, uh, first of all, I want us to take a moment of silence for three members of our community who passed away recently this, this month. Dick Roberts, one of our founding faculty, uh, Tom Matthew would appreciate this, in mathematics, who uh, was chair of the department and did a superb job in establishing this department in early years so that one day we could be as we are today, 22nd in the, in the world. Michelle Smith, a dedicated member of the Financial Services Office who touched many lives. I had a chance to speak at her funeral recently and uh, just a very special woman who went around to all of us in the last six weeks or so, bringing us to a place of kind of peace, inner peace and acceptance. I'll never forget she said to me, just a few weeks before she died, she just looked in my face and she said, it'll be okay. And she was, it was an amazing story of inspiration. And then finally, uh, Colin Bowen, who, whom I recognized at commencement just two years ago. Very proud of him. Young man who had just graduated in computer science. Um, his wife had taught here. Uh, had gotten a degree from here, also Ursula in intercultural communications. And, uh, and so sadly, he was injured just two weeks before coming home in a roadside bomb in Afghanistan. And just, I was there at the burial and it was, uh, to watch Ursula with her little girls was just so touching, it really was. And thought about it, there were UMBC people at all these activities, just supporting people in need. So take a moment, just for silence, please. Thank you very much. And just as we celebrate the lives of people who have died and think about community, we think about the achievements of the campus, and there are many. There are many. Um, uh, and I have to tell you that somehow, um, uh, you, he'll hear this from somebody, Randy Monroe has made a believer out of me somehow, <laughs> all right? Uh, believe me, we made history in basketball. Would you please give us a hand for that, please? He's there, he's there, so Randy stands. Stand. And, and Charlie Brown, and all the staff members from Baltimore, all the coaches, assistant coach, you stand up. Please, and Charlie Brown, yes. We're very proud of all, yes. Very nice, I mean, it was, I mean, there were so many faculty and staff and students, the, the rack has never been so full. The rack has never been so full, and, and, and really, down in North Carolina, I don't think it was any more touching moment than at the end of the game and they played the alma mater in Raleigh and all of these UMBC people with the colors on, it was a standing ovation. Uh, just unbelievable the, the dignity with which our coaching and the students handle themselves and the fact that all of our seniors are graduating. Give me a big hand for that too. <laughs> Very proud of that. Very proud of that. The balance, 
as I've said to many people, all of you know I'm, I'm, I'm kind of nerdy. I'm getting into this athletic thing because it's so clear to me that it's one of the few ways you get light shining on the whole place on a national level so that people can see how strong the academics are. And so, and faculty get that. I saw chairs of departments and others there, staff members and students really enjoy, and community life. I mean, just the idea of student life and retention. And so we, the, the theme for next year, and I love it from our coaches, let's do it again. So give them one more hand as we get ready to go again. <laughs> and then, quite frankly, um, I want to also give Alan Sherman and the chess team a hand. It's not bad to be second in the country in chess. Would you give them a hand for that, please? I came on campus, and the president of the University of Texas, Dallas, was here. Um, I didn't even know he was coming, and I got a chance to walk him around. And, and all he kept saying, I had known him because he was Dean Warren, he was this Dean of Engineering at my alma mater at the University of Illinois. He had never been to our campus. and. Uh, he said something very interesting. He's just gotten a $30 million gift to enhance the beauty of their campus. And he said something very interesting. I mean, because Texas, Texas is like another country to have so much money, right? <laughs> but he said, you know, I, I, he said to me, I want to look like this. Imagine, right? He looked around. He was just amazed at just how well our campus has done in, in beautifying the place. And then, those of you who participated in the Meyerhoff, the fact is for this 20th anniversary, this is a celebration for faculty and staff at this university, that we are seen as a national model for inclusiveness, bringing back hundreds of people who finished graduate degrees who are on the faculties at University of Michigan and up at the Ivies. It's a, it's a great story, and we're very proud of that. Let me mention just a few of the faculty and staff awards. It is a big deal that we're second in the country in funding from NASA. It says so much, all these joint centers that we have, about the quality of research that we have, that the faculty in geosciences rank third in the nation in citation awards, that the departments of information systems and public policy are ranked eighth and tenth respectively for scholarly productivity according to 19, 2007 Faculty Scholarly Productivity Index, that Manil Suri is getting unbelievable, unbelievable um, um, recognition for this second book, The Age of Shiva, uh, for two weeks, he, he was saying, well, it's doing okay. It's, the book is doing all right. If you know Manila at all and math, people know. He's, he's, he said, it's doing okay. And he said, oh, God. I said, but you got a great review in the New York Times. They were saying it was more literary than Gone with the Wind. Well, my English colleagues, I mean, you know, we don't know anything about how literary Gone with the Wind was, but, but just the fact that they said it in the New York Times <laughs> sells books, all right? It's a good deal. But he, he says to me, with such a me, he said, oh, I forgot to tell you, I, I, the book has been for two weeks first in India, and first number one bestseller in India. Give him a hand for that, would you? I mean, <laughs> for two weeks, it's unbelievable. But the, the Multicultural Country Computational Center with IBM that we have now, and a new major grant for almost $5 million uh, involved that Tim Finan was responsible for in uh, something called Assured Information Sharing going from a model of need to know to a model of need to share. And we are the lead university with, again, my alma mater, Urbana-Champaign, and with Purdue and Michigan and Texas in looking at some of these issues in the computing area in a multidisciplinary fashion. And then a lot of other grants. But I do want to mention uh, Professor Ari Yoshioka, who uh, recently received the prestigious Robert the McGraw-Hill Robert Sherman Award for Music Education and Outreach. She'll get a chance to use funds to start music education uh, a resource website for teachers and students, and also uh, is, has been acclaimed for her uh, live performances on prominent classical uh, music stations there in New York City. Uh, so we're very proud of Professor Yoshioka. And then in terms of student awards, now probably the most prestigious of all is the Gates Cambridge at this point. No, make no mistake about it. There are 40 plus, about 40 something in the country given. For the second year in a row, we're getting one of these. and, and um, uh, it is an amazing accomplishment from one of our physics students, uh, Philip, is getting this. He will go to, to, uh, to uh, uh, Cambridge in gravitational physics. And wh what's amazing is I said to him, and I had him speaking at the Board of Visitors meeting, I had the basketball team there with the coach, and they were so impressed by these young men and the way they handled themselves. And then I had this, this gay scholar speaking. Uh, and I said, well, how much, how much of your education will they pay for? Well, it's going to be, I don't know, he's going to be there, I don't know, five, six years. And he said, every dime. 
I mean, it's the Rhodes. If you keep hearing this, it's like the Rhodes of the 21st century, the Gates Cambridge Scholarship. Very impressive. But we've got students already going to Cambridge, Cornell, MIT, Hopkins, Rice, Purdue, and the list goes on and on and on. People going to a variety of companies. It's a great story. Many of you looked at the Prove It campaign. It is so impressive that our students had this campaign working with staff and faculty designed to improve student life here and major competition faculty and staff participated in it and the the winner gets fifty thousand dollars and that's fifty thousand dollars from student money All right, it's, it's I mean from the money that they have it's a big deal that they would want to use they could have been using that money for a party All right, so it, it says a lot about how serious our students are and the winner was green space which is addressing a continuing effort to preserve usable green space here uh, it will be used to develop a park with benches, tables, landscaping that will be open to the entire community. Very impressive. And, and that, that works well anyway, I should say, because we are beautifying the campus. And I want to take a moment and welcome back Jim Dunling, who has had two tours, one stateside and one in the rack. Uh, he does a great job. He's done a great job for our country. His, we've represented, uh, he's represented us all really well. Jim, is Jim here somewhere? Stand up, Jim. Give Jim a hand, would you? Very proud of him. Very proud of him. Jim is another one of our colleagues who has a brilliant son who's coming here in the, in the fall. Give him a big hand for becoming a parent. That's right. I'm really pleased. It's like Claudia's brilliant mile of scholar. I'm really glad. Lindsay, right? The, uh, and then the, and I want to thank Joe Hill and the whole facilities management group. The campus looks great. And they're getting ready for a new student day. Watch, they're just trying to work. Because people look at how you, how you appear. When they come on campus, they are amazed with this. So give all of the people for facilities management a hand. Would you? <laughs> Terry, I appreciate what you're doing. And I assume everybody's met our new Terry. Stand up, Terry, just so they know who you are. Terry has just come to us. We've known her from the UMB days and all of that. But Terry, give her a hand, would you please? <laughs> just one or two other points about our staff. Lynn Schaefer was named Maryland's top 100 women, one of the top 100 women by the Daily Record. Give Lynn a hand. We're very proud of that. Is Lynn here? Oh, she's here. Lynn Schaefer. Yeah, yeah, good, good. Really proud of her. Dale may not be here, but Dale was named one of the top ten admissions directors by the Chronicle of Higher Education. Give Dale a hand in that. Is he here? Dale here? Oh, good. Dale. Good. Very, very nice. And let me just say, and Charlie Brown would want me to mention, in addition to basketball making history, I want to mention that the swimming team, men's and women's diving uh, and swimming teams, won first. Um, um, Amazing to have both of them do it in back-to-back -back championships. Give them a hand for swimming. Would you please? <laughs> and lacrosse is the hottest team in town. Give them a big hand for that for lacrosse. The hottest lacrosse team. Six consecutive games. Women's tennis has won the past eight straight matches. Big hand for them. All right. <laughs> and this is one I really didn't know because I didn't. We have something called co-ed flat flag football here that I'm just, I'm reading this for the first time, folks, all right? You heard it here first on the tape. And they just advanced to the national championship. Give them a big hand. <laughs> Who would have known? <laughs> and Alex Broadwell just won the National Collegiate Wrestling Association Club Tournament. tournament. Give him a hand. We are all, Charlie's very pleased. He wanted me to mention his other sports. I'm like, <laughs> we're making history from basketball to the others. And, and again, we need to keep in mind this helps to build campus life. When you've got serious students who are able to compete like this and to get this light shining on us makes a big difference. So while they're talking about students doing well, um, I didn't mention it and I should. The National Society of Black Engineers for the second in a row, they have won in the country first and second places in the Tech Bowl. Beating Georgia Tech, MIT, give them a hand. It's a good deal. <laughs> And then two final awards, I mean, because I could go on and on, but I was so proud of the new media studio uh, when they worked on this digital storytelling project. There's a copy of the video. If you've not seen it, the, the DVD, you really would be impressed. Uh, this is a pioneering and unique project combining efforts of the Retirement Living TV, UMBC, and citizens of the Charlestown retirement community with our college students interviewing them on their families' lives, on their, on their stories, using technology. And uh, they won... Um, uh, it's an amazing uh, prize called the Telly. It's a really nice award, and so if you haven't seen that, please look at that. You would be very impressed. And then finally, I want to I want to really commend Michelle Wolf and David Hoffman and Lee Calizo um, from Student Life and Delena from uh, the Sunheim Scholars Program, Delena Gregg 
and Michelle from the Shriver Center because they worked together to develop this innovative proposal involving a Kaufman and uh, it has worked really well to get a major grant to focus on things for the good of UMBC and it's called the part of the Kaufman Initiative. Give them a big hand for that. Mm -hmm. And so whether talking about entrepreneurship and the companies that we have started and the fact that we're about to finish the research park or talking about the Activate program that several people, Claudia and others, have mentioned and all the women entrepreneurs who are doing well and getting all kinds of awards, the 2007 Innovation Award from the Association of University Research uh, Parks and the 2008 U.S. Association for Small Businesses. Everybody's looking at what we're doing with the National Science Foundation to focus on women in technology and entrepreneurship. Uh, I am very impressed by these Kaufman faculty fellows in history, in mechanical engineering, Yuri Tosh, who likes to keep me going up here, and, and Bill, of course, in chemistry, who are working on entrepreneurship in those areas, to others who are focusing in the humanities um, in the same area of entrepreneurship across the, the, the curriculum. It is an impressive story. We now have departments in music and education, focusing on this area, innovation grants in uh, mathematics uh, and information systems, engineering, and in English. And so this will be, it's very unusual to see uh, entrepreneurship across the curriculum. And this is what Kaufman is very pleased about. I'll tell you, we did not get the Kaufman grant the first time. They, they actually called me after telling us that we didn't get the grant and said, but we had made the best presentation, so they wanted to use our presentation as a model for other campuses. <laughs> Can you imagine? I have never been so insulted. It's supposed to be a compliment somehow. And I said, I, I guess I'm supposed to be somehow. So we, we kept working on this. We did get the money the second time. What is interesting at this point is that uh, I am hearing behind the scenes that they are not pleased with those people who supposedly beat us out the first time and that we are being seen not just because of presentation, but because of substance, of faculty, in the humanities, in the arts, and engineering doing this work. So my goal is to get much more money from Kaufman, so you keep that thought <laughs> as, as the idea. The campaign is going extraordinarily well, $85 million. Give us a hand for that. It's a big deal. <laughs> and we're other talking about, I mean, people came up to me after this past weekend when we had all faculty and staff at the Mauhoff, and. Panos, I want you to hear this. They kept hearing about mechanical engineering over and over again. It was just impressive the way faculty and biology and chemistry, all these areas, and they kept saying, well, are the faculty just that committed? And my point to them was, yes, they are. Faculty and staff on this campus are extraordinarily committed, doing an extremely good job. I don't think anybody's been more committed to our, than our provost. He's going to get embarrassed about saying this, but he did a lot of things for this university. You may not know this. He is the longest tenured provost in the history of UMBC. So give him one more hand, would you? Very, very nice. It's a good 10-year stretch. It really is. Very, very huh? In the short history of UMBC. What well, do you think? 10 years out of 40, he's been provost a quarter of that time. It's not, not a bad story. And, and Elliot is looking forward to coming over. You'll be meeting him soon. Let me close by saying uh, I am always surprised at just how much we're able to accomplish with so little. When you think about this legislative session and the fact that, yeah, we're getting, we'll get raises for salaries, but nothing like the money we need. My deans, my colleagues who are deans will tell you they're constantly trying to scratch together one piece of money or another to get things done where other people can just easily have it done. Chairs know how stretched they are. Faculty and staff know how we tend to have uh, one person doing the job that on many campuses you see two people doing. You don't have to go far to see that in, in a lot of different settings, whether in Baltimore or in all the Washington institutions that have more money than we have. And you see it when I'm talking with the faculty sanitary. I mean, everybody's asking though the same questions. I think what helps us to do so well, in spite of limited resources, is that we have the same values. We do care about our students. We care enough that people send their sons and daughters to UMBC because they know they can get an education. We do care about each other and colleagues. Do we give people all of what they need? No. No, I do know that. But I, I really believe all of us know as we get more money, as we see things like basketball, shedding light, bringing in more students, getting more donors, alumni are much more excited when they see exciting athletics. Make no mistake about it. And this is our challenge as a, as a great academic institution. We need that side of things to pull people back. I can't tell you how many alumni at the end of the game uh, when we won on campus were saying to me, we've got to give you some support. People who had never 
said anything like that before. So as we can bring in more money and more students and students from other places, confirmations are up, out of state confirmations, which is a good thing, really is, we'll have more money and it will be better times for this university. But make no mistake about it, I don't think there is any institution in this country more entrepreneurial, more giving than this one because faculty and staff and really great students care deeply about the concept of a UMBC. And so as you leave today, as we celebrate the achievements of these wonderful faculty and staff, just remember it is an honor for all of us to be together and it will get even better with time. Thank you all very much. <laughs>